everybody, and uh, welcome to the May 13th, 2021 Library Board of Trustees virtual meeting. Um, as you all know, we're still conducting our meetings remotely and held by video conference to ensure the health and safety of the public and the staff and the trustees. Um, the, the public can join us. Public access is available um, through Zoom. And there's a link at the website on the city and at the library site and or through calling in um, and entering the Zoom meeting. Okay, so. Bianca, could I introduce? Um, yes, I'm sorry. Person. Thank you. S yes, S Sally, yes. thank you for introducing. Yes, everyone who doesn't know PJ Lutz of SPEF fame. She is the executive vice president of the Friends, and uh, she's attending here tonight with me in preparation for her becoming the president, hopefully next year. Ah, yeah. very good. W w welcome, PJ. Oh, and there's Dean. And look at Dean is wearing pink. And Diana is just joining as well. Diana. I'm sorry, wearing pink? Are you wearing pink? Oh, yes, look at that. No, orange. <laughs> orange, well, it looks pink. I, 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 have, I have colored lights that I um, have on. No, we're just. It's pink enough. We're just, we're, we're all in very bright, springy colors tonight, so. I, I do have right. some short, I have shorts on that have pink on them. <laughs> All right, well, I think we're all here. And again, welcome everybody to our uh, May. Can you believe this? It's May 13th. Wow. Okay. Uh, should um, I take roll? Yes. How about roll call, Sean? Okay. Bianca Richards. Present. David Ewens. Here. Annie Chang Long. Here. Dean Serwin. Present. Thank you. And uh, for those of you who didn't hear, um, uh, Mario Molina might have had, he, has a conflict tonight, so he isn't able to uh, join us. But we do have a quorum, so. And we have a guest, if for those of you who don't know, PJ Lutz. Yes. Executive Vice President of the Friends. Yes, and thank you. And then of course, uh, Mayor Mahmood is with us. Okay, um, and of course, Kathy and Sean are with us. We can't do this without Kathy and Sean. Um, right. I don't think we have any presentations tonight. Yeah. And did we have any public comment? No public comments. All right. And we'll move on to our, our action item. Did you all um, get to review um, the minutes? And always, I want to say, Sean, you do excellent minutes, and I really appreciate it. They're, very much so. They're very thorough. Yeah. So thank you very much, Sean. Thank you. Thank you. Any corrections or edits in regards to the minutes of last meeting? All right, well then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll okay. make them. I, I'll uh, propose that we approve them. Great, and I can go ahead and second them. So it's been approved by David and seconded by Bianca um, to approve the minutes of the, uh, the last meeting of April 8th. So thank you. And as we move on, so, um, we'll, we'll we'll do do roll call. Yes. Oh, sorry. Roll, roll call of the minutes. So, uh, Bianca Richards. Uh, yes. David Ewens. Yes. Annie Chang Long. Yes. Dean Serwin. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And then on to our uh, discussion items, and and um, I, I know we have a lot of uh, discussion items, but I you know but. We'll just head right into them. So should we just start with um, the reintroduction of in-library services? So Kathy, you wanna lead us on that discussion? Yes, I will do so. And yeah, don't be afraid of the agenda. You know, we, we decided at the last meeting to um, add all of the work plan items, but it doesn't necessarily mean we have much to, to we don't have much to, don't have to spend much time on them. So uh, reintroduction of in-library services. We are really excited. We are almost there. It's Monday is the big day and uh, we've been running around like crazy um, trying to get all the things checked off our list, uh, retraining staff, refreshing staff on all kinds of different policies and procedures plus new things that are different now that we're operating in this kind of um, modified fashion. 
So we're, we're good. We're ready to go. I wanted to share my screen and just show you some, a couple of things that are related to this. So let me do that quickly if I could. Uh, the first thing I'm going to share with you. Uh, the first thing I wanted to share is just our publicity. So this is the bookmark that we've printed. Um, and the backside has all of the, you know, information that people need about what's going to be offered, what are the rules, what is not going to be offered. Um, so these are, these have been being handed out this week and, um, Patrons are very excited. We're getting a lot of excited feedback at the door. People are excited to be back to the library. So it'll be interesting to see what Monday is like in terms of, you know, are people actually gonna be yeah. there and get in right at one or, or we'll see. Um, and as far as some of the other issues, you know, some of the issues that we had been waiting on, I can give you some updates on those. Um, I'm gonna keep my, well, I'll stop sharing my screen so you don't have to see that. but. Um, the HVAC evaluation has not been uh, completed, but I heard today that they will be on site Monday. So better uh, late than never uh, is I guess the motto there. So they'll be doing that. We'll see what that uh, results in. My, As I've said before, my guess is that our system is too old probably to accommodate the higher grade filters in any case, but it will be good to have the facts at our disposal. So if anybody asks, we have that information and the county requires it. So, so they'll do that on Monday. Um, we'll see what happens with that. We also acquired um, six big uh, air purifiers that, um, you know, it's not enough for the whole building, but uh, I think that it's it's reassuring to people to have those in some of the kind of closer spaces with the lower ceilings. So we have one in the children's, one in the teen room, um, one in the kind of the group study nonfiction area, one over in the quiet area by the magazines and the fiction. So we've kind of have them sprinkled around and we also purchase smaller ones um, that cover a, a smaller amount of space for the four public restrooms because the fans in those don't necessarily work. We have broken fans that don't work and nobody can fix them. So um, we wanted to make sure there was some air filtration happening in that space. So that's ready to go and good. Um, the staff did participate, all of us participated in a, um, a training, which that was the other thing I was gonna share with you about how to handle uh, customers that refuse to wear masks or who aren't wearing masks. It was a really great training. The person who does this training is, um, he's a uh, director of a, of a shelter um, outside of Chicago, very big shelter. And he does, he's a lawyer, <clears throat> excuse me, and also has his master's degree in public administration. And so he, he, this is what he does for a living. He trains people on how to have empathetic and effective interactions, you know, around these types of things. So I want to show you the main uh, piece that we're going to take advantage of from that training, which um, is basically just a kind of a, a three-step guideline for kind of how to how to handle this you know step one people probably just made a mistake they don't they're not really opposed to the rule they just maybe forgot their mask so um, kind of how to deal with you know take those steps if, if that's the case and then there are the people that they don't agree they don't disagree they're just sort of going to do whatever is easiest so they're probably going to be fine putting on a mask because they want to come to the library um, and then the last group of people are the people that are the challenge. Um, and so he gave us some good, good tips on how to handle those interactions, you know, listening, um, not having an argument, you know, restating the rules, restating the guidelines, you know, so I think it was really effective. I think, um, staff, I think staff enjoyed it. We had a nice kind of, um, debrief afterwards to talk about what we didn't like or what we thought we didn't like. There were some things that he, um, he was big on. Oh, Mario joined us. That's great. He, he had some things like, you know, blame, blame the system. And, and sort of, I didn't, we weren't comfortable with that. You know, we, we believe you should wear masks. Um, and, you know, we're not here to get into an argument with anybody, but, but we're not going to pretend that 
well, who knows what's right? Maybe, but that's what we have to do. That was one of his tips and we weren't, we weren't comfortable with that. So there were a few things that we didn't think would work for us, but all in all, it was really helpful. And um, I think people feel good and prepared about how to handle those situations. I'm really not anticipating that much difficulty. I think by and large, our customers are going to be you know, compliant, they want to come in the library and, and if they don't have a mask, it's just going to be that they forgot and we have plenty to hand out. We have children sized masks also to hand out if people forgot their masks. So I don't think we're gonna have a lot of trouble. Um, Kathy, Kathy, Kathy yeah. I think Dean had a question. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'm wondering how that stands in the wake of the announcements today of no requirement of wearing masks indoors if you're fully vaccinated. Yeah, so we are under the the we are under the um, jurisdiction of the county of Los Angeles Department of Public Health. So the CDC can announce whatever they want, but the county is not changing their rules at this time. They put out a press release fairly shortly after the CDC saying, you know, we'll look at this, we'll we'll decide. I don't anticipate them changing it. They have a very good um, one page PDF on the website that are the county's rules which do still require indoor masks. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it adds a, a layer of challenge, which we already had anyway, because people are tired of wearing masks and you know they're hearing the governor say, you know, we're not gonna have masks anymore. So uh, that's all, people only hear the, the kind of the lead. Um, but again, I, you know, we're capable of explaining to them that, yeah, the CDC did make that announcement, but you know, we're under the county's jurisdiction and these are the county rules and I'm happy to share those rules with you. I have them right here, you know. So I think that, yes, it might make our job a little bit harder because people, you know, already people are like, David said before we started the meeting, he mentioned being in the park and a lot of people aren't wearing masks. So people are out and about without masks and they might say, oh, maybe we'll just go to the library. But again, we have masks that we can give them. So um, I think it will be okay, but it definitely, definitely adds to the confusion about what are the rules? Whose rules do we follow? I mean, the average person isn't as up to speed on, on all of that as, as the library staff are, but I'm not too worried about it, Sally. Yes, as far as the fans, are there any in the, the back workroom and then in those real close area like the processing room for the volunteers? Yeah, we're going to put one of the big, big right. machines back in that staff area. <clears throat> they cover, I have to look at my, they cover about 1200 square feet. Um, and that staff area is probably... I didn't do the math for that area. I only did the math for the public areas, but it's probably around 1200. It's probably 1200, 1500. So it will help in that space for sure. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. It should help in that space. Right. Yeah. I had a question. Kathy, are you going to keep any of the doors open? Yeah, the doors will both be open. Yeah. Because yeah. the, the takeout station will stay as is. And then, um, our intent is to have the other door propped open as well. I mean, the only thing that could happen is if later in the summer it gets very hot and we need to think differently about that. But the way that the the way that the approach works, so when you approach the library, there's a big 30 by 40 inch sign that's going to direct you either to take out or to in library services. Um, and then when you get to the in library services, there's a sign that says, "Please stop." and it has all the rules and that's where our staff person greets you and you know it confirms that you understand the rules and you're going to comply with them and then in they go so that door will probably be propped open we don't want people having to touch the door handle you know over yeah. so and then um when people enter what are they um uh because there's no there's no sitting there's just going to be browsing mm -hmm. But uh, what about people who might have some oversized uh, articles or? Yeah, yeah, the staff, we were talking about this because of course this is a challenge, has always been an issue. You know, people um, <clears throat> bring things in that, uh, you know, it's excessive, excessive baggage is what I would call it. The, the code of conduct is, is very specific in the items that it lists that are not allowed and it's not very helpful for enforcement because 
it has, you know, bed rolls and sleeping bags. Well, so if I bring a baby carriage that's piled with black garbage bags, that's not on the list. So <laughs> I there, but we have ways, you know, I mean, if, if, if the, the fundamental rule of the library that is that everybody's supposed to be able to, to enjoy it equally and use the services as they were intended to be used. So if people are bringing in an excessive amount of baggage, that's definitely going to interfere with with the purpose of the library and we would be able to you know ask someone to to remove that material um, and this is something that we deal with all the time uh, someday it might be worth trying to change that code of conduct so that it's um, a different measure uh, in glendale we used actual um, cubic inches so you know somebody would have two suitcases and uh, we'd get out our tape measure and it would be too big. So, um, so yeah, we just have to enforce that. And it's either based on the, the code of conduct and what's specifically prohibited, or it's based on whatever this material is interfering with the normal operation of the library, because that's not acceptable either. So, and then the other thing I wanted to mention about masks is we had talked, uh, the city attorney had mentioned, and we, I had mentioned to you that we might want to, um, have the board adopt a rule about masks, but I really decided it's not necessary. The, the code of conduct already says that no illegal behavior is allowed and not wearing a mask is illegal behavior. So I don't, I didn't think it was worth um, doing an action item that we later have to rescind. Um, I, I think we have plenty of grounds to, to enforce what we need to enforce. Um, but otherwise, we're we're ready to go. I mean, boy, we very have been very busy. We um, are having the carpets cleaned on Friday night. Yesterday, we we uh, transitioned from the whole process of of checking the materials out in advance. So now, if you come to take out, your materials aren't checked out yet. They're on the self service hold shelf, and then we will get them and check them out to you at that time. So that was a big transition and totally you know, changed the process that we've been doing the last, you know, eight or nine months. Um, so that was good to get that done. We started auto renewal, notif um, not auto renewal, excuse me, our hold notifications by email, which is part of this also. Um, so that started, I think yesterday we turned that on. So now people are getting their hold notifications by email. If they have an email in the system, if they don't, they'll still get a phone call. Um, so yeah, I think we've worked through all, all, everything we need to work through. Again, we've done a lot of training, a lot of discussion, um, and you know, a lot of technical stuff behind the scenes, and we're we're ready to go. So it's exciting. I I have a few things, Kathy. Yeah. Uh, the people who are returning books, will they be permitted to bring them into the library to return them, or what's the plan there if someone walks in? <clears throat> They, they're looking and then also retire. Yeah, so we're, we're going to ask them to continue to use the outdoor book drop. We had hoped to get um, it, it's, the book drop that's um, at the circulation desk uh, has not been great for us. I mean, that that went in in February 2019 and then, you know, we closed in March 2020. So we had it for about a year. Uh, we're having we're thinking about kind of changing that process entirely. Um, so that the books aren't coming in at the circ desk, because what ends up happening is the person that's working there, you mix up the things that are coming in with the things that are going out. It, it just becomes um, it becomes uh, unproductive and and leads to making a lot of mistakes. So we had hoped to buy an in interior book drop that's like freestanding that we could kind of put somewhere else, um, but we weren't able to do that in time, and we may not be able to afford it. Um, so we are going to ask people to continue to use the outdoor drops and we made a sign like a 22 by 28 inch sign and that's one of the main things that that sign says is, you know, please continue to use the outdoor book drops. So hopefully they'll see that before they get okay. too far. Okay. Um, you mentioned that the restroom plans weren't working or inadequate. And yeah, and a couple of the restrooms, I, I can't say for sure how many at the moment. I know uh, we have a staff restroom where the fan is not working. Um, I think I think there's at least one public restroom that's not working, the fan is not working, and we'll probably keep that one locked. It, basically, if the fan's not working, especially in these small upstairs restrooms, we will probably just keep those locked and, and not use them. And, and, and the city's going to fix them, right? 
I hope so. They've tried many, many times with some of these fans. Um, but yes, we have a request in to have them fixed. Okay. And then the last item is, uh, what, what kind of publicity uh, above and beyond that you have? Is there any plans to have either of the newspapers that we have uh, come next week to see people in the library? I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, I haven't asked them to, you know, we put out the press release, which hopefully you guys all received the way that they're doing press releases now is that the city manager sends it to all the commissions. So you guys should see everything we send. Um, I believe that Andy Lippman wrote a piece for yes. the South Pasadena Review, but that'll yes. be, Friday. I haven't seen it yet. Friday, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it'd be fun if somebody wanted to come and take pictures, um, but I haven't heard from anyone. The South Pasadena has the press release on its website, so that information is there. I put it on Nextdoor. We put it, you know, obviously on social media. We sent out our constant contact email, and we sent that not just to our list, but to the whole city list, so the people who get the Neighborhood Pulse newsletter. Um, so that's a lot of people, 4,000, 5,000 people. We put an ad, uh, like a eight page ad in the South Pasadena Review so that people who don't have, you know, who aren't on the computer, don't have devices might see that. So we might hit some people that wouldn't know otherwise. My, 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 my thinking was just actual photographs of people coming in and enjoying the library, even if it's, you know, board members and, and friends of the library or something yeah. like that. Um, Malik, do you feel like, do you want to talk I to agree. Them? Yeah. Can I, I agree with David. I think that's, that'd be an excellent uh, PR move. Yeah, for uh, Zane Hill. Yeah, maybe so Hank would be able to come to South Pasadena. Yeah. If you're willing to look into that, I would appreciate it. Yeah, I'd be happy to. I'll even wear my pink shirt again. <laughs> <laughs> So that's all I well, have. Unless one o'clock. Other questions about this. Sorry, go ahead. One o'clock. Your opening. Yes. Yeah. One o'clock. Um, we are going to stay with these hours at least initially. Just yeah. okay. we really want to see how it goes, get a handle on it, see what the demand is like, see what things didn't work the way we thought they would, um, and then expand the hours afterwards. Just one last question, Kathy. You might have said this, but is it at full capacity or what percentage capacity? Yeah, we're doing 40% capacity. We're allowed to do 75% capacity. But again, we're going to start with 40 just to see how that goes and how that feels and whether whether we're able to you know, manage that amount of people. Um, so that's about once you take the staff off the top of, the, of that number, it's like... Um, about eight people in the children's room per square by based on the square footage requirements. It's about eight people in the in the children's room and um, 21 elsewhere. It's like 30 people. And obviously, you know, if we've got seven people in the children's room and a family of four comes, that's fine. You know what I mean? It doesn't have to be exactly eight um, because we can go up to 75. So if we was staff monitoring that or yeah. The, the person who's the person who's in charge at the door, the greeter at the library bridge door, oh, it has to keep track of that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead, Sally. Kathy, did you say you measured, you took the square footage of the first floor? What is it? Well, Sean, I, Sean am I right that the 24,500 is the square footage of the library? I believe that is true. That's what we've seen and heard. I upstairs. What's that? Upstairs, upstairs too, right? I think that includes upstairs too. Not the I, community. I don't want to give these numbers because I did it using um, the the drawings from the 1982 renovation, and mm -hmm. I am not an architect, so I'll, I'll be happy to share that with you later. But I do have kind of various areas um, with approximate square footage, which is what we use to calculate the capacity. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I didn't do like a total number for the first floor, so I really don't have that. Mm -hmm. But we could just subtract the, well, anyway. Yeah, it's, it's all right, yeah. <clears throat> okay, well, thank you. It sounds like you guys got it covered mm -hmm. and we'll just, you know, we'll just see how it goes and we'll relook, we, you know, you guys can relook at it afterwards, so thank you. I think it's gonna go great. I'm not, I I'm, I'm think it's gonna be good and I'm excited. I think, I think staff are excited too.
All right, and now the, the budget. Yes, so um, in your packet mm -hmm. is a um, report that's showing you the, our expenses to date as of the date the report was run, which was the 10th of May. Um, and this report does include all salaries. I know reports I've given to you in the past have not had the salary um, expenses loaded to date, but they are now, so that's good news. Um, a couple of things. So the, the main thing that I will say, and then I, and I'm sure you may have questions and I will answer them, but a couple of things that I'll say initially is that uh, we are gonna be over budget in both part-time and probably full-time. The part-time budget was not adequate. I'm not sure what happened. I asked for a certain amount. And then in February, when we were revisiting the budget to, to get it prepared to go back to council to finally approve one late in the fiscal year, um, they asked me for my estimate for, for February through June 30th. And the number that I gave them they then find they being finance added together they came up with this number 196 i had come up with about 250 250,000 and i told them at that time we are going to go over 196 and they said don't worry about it it'll all even out um but since we are also going to be over a little bit i'm estimating about $28,000 in the full-time salary line we're actually you know kind of short, you know, it's about 70 something thousand dollars that that we're going to be short in salaries. So uh, we're going to try to make that up in a couple of ways. Uh, first of all, finance is going to try to transfer some funds from a different department that did not spend all of its salary funds. So that will help to compensate for that. You know, we just need our bottom line to come in balanced um, for the auditor's sake. Um, and then we will have to um, try to do some cost savings in the maintenance and operations budget, which is possible. You know, there's a lot of things, partly because the, the year was so strange, you know, we didn't have a budget until March, so we weren't able to spend. So there's, there's quite a lot of unspent funds in maintenance and operations, which of course we had hoped to try to spend as much as we could, um, even in this short little window of time. Um, so we still will be able to spend some of it, but but we're going to have to set aside some of it to make up for the shortage um, in the salary spots. So that's the main thing about this year's budget. We are, like I said, bef before I had this budget meeting and, and found out that they would expect us to make some of that up out of the maintenance operations, we were going um, gangbusters trying to buy things. <clears throat> so we have bought a few things. We we have our shelving for the children's area coming. Um, uh, so that should be here pretty soon. And we bought some new carts. We bought some flat files for local history. Um, we're hoping to um, get some furnishings for the children's office because that that is not an ergonomically um, acceptable workstation for someone. So that needs to get done. So, so we're trying to get a few things done at the end of the year, maybe not as many as we had hoped to do, um, but we'll do the best we can and, and come out with a balanced budget, which is the main, the main objective. And we did also, I didn't say this, but we, we did get our emergency lighting system replaced. So that's done. <clears throat> so I'm happy Kathy, to answer questions if you have questions. Kathy, yeah. the new budget year begins July 1, is that right? So you're working on budgets for next year already, right? That's in the packet, yep. So hopefully they won't make the same mistake again next year. Right. Yeah, I, I proposed a number. Well, if you don't have any questions about the current year, we can move on to the next year and I can explain where that stands. Yeah, I'm, I'm more concerned about next year's budget. Yeah, any, any questions about this year and the end of year? The only question I have, is there any... Uh, additional funds coming to the library either through the uh, state or any COVID kind of, you know, federal, <clears throat> state, anything like that? And if there I, is, will it be applied to next year? 
It's likely that there will be, but I, it's too soon to really know what that's going to look like. I, when I, when we get to library operations, I'll talk a little bit about that, but it's, um, there probably will be money for libraries, but there's just really no way of knowing okay. how much might be for us, uh, you know, how they're going to disperse it. Is it going to be competitive? Is it going to be, uh, but we'll talk about it a little bit. I have a few things to share with you about that when we get to, um, when we get to, uh, updates. Okay, great. Sally? Will you be buying the kiosk under this year's well, no money, so that we can buy any time. Yeah. Uh, the reason we haven't bought it yet is simply because we don't have the staff capacity to to get it up and running right now. Right. <laughs> you know, it's partly partly the reason we've asked for that uh, position next year. The librarian that would be a, a technology support services librarian. That's the kind of thing that person would be responsible for. Oh, yeah. So we're gonna have to if we don't get that position, we'll have to figure out how we're gonna approach that. I did, um, as we'll talk about it, uh, the next next year's budget, I did budget a little extra for um, our ACORN, which is our tech support yeah. company um, to help us with that if we don't have the staff to do it ourselves. Um, so, yeah. so Kathy, I'm just wondering, perhaps we should buy the kiosk sooner rather than later so that we avoid prices going up? Yeah, we could do that. I mean, we can order it and just get it on site and it can sit here. So we can talk, Sally, okay. um, about it. We can talk about the best way to do it, whether it's for you guys to, to give the money to the city or for you to just pay the bill. Let's let's talk about it. Okay. That's a good point. Um, so yeah, we can look into that. Once we get open and aren't quite so um, busy, <laughs> we'll have time to look at that. Any other questions about this year? If not, um, this didn't print right for me, so it's a little goofy. Hopefully you guys are seeing it in its <clears throat> uh, landscape format. Um, so next fiscal year's budget, I included both uh, our what I proposed to finance. So this is by no means a, a decided budget, but I have met with the finance director and their two senior staff to go over it. We met on Tuesday or Monday, I believe, um, and made very few adjustments based on that meeting. The main adjustment was um, really, I mean, almost no adjustments to maintenance and operations, um, which I had kept very flat. I mean, we had been asked to keep everything flat. Um, we benefited this for the proposed budget because we have a new five-year scenic contract for our Wi-Fi, and it's about a third, uh, a third less than what we had paid previously. So that kind of freed up money that we used to have to budget for that. So we were able to, you know, work with that funding. We also our our last year's budget had a huge amount of money in building maintenance for the porta potty. And we don't um, need to budget for that. So that money also was then sort of free to move around. So I feel pretty good about the maintenance and operations uh, things that we've asked for. It's still, you know, we're not, we're not where we were um, in 2018-19. But I think, you know, with the pandemic, um, that's sort of to be expected. And hopefully we do get back up to, you know, the, the amount we, we had been paying, you know, getting before for books, for example. So for example, what we've asked for for books is, um, you know, not just books, books, DVDs, CDs, audiobooks, et cetera. Um, we asked for $90,000 for the physical stuff and 30,000 for the eBooks and e-audiobooks. So if you add those together, it's 120,000. When we were getting the, the most we ever got was in 1920. Um, but prior to that, we'd been getting about 130 every year. So we're at 120. So we're not that much under where we have been in the past. Um, as far as staffing goes, so the staffing story is that um, I have been giving you erroneous information about the status of the assistant library director position. Um, I found out after our last meeting that that position was eliminated um, at a city council meeting in September, September 2nd. And oh. I take responsibility. I mean, no one spoke to me about it. So I've expressed my dismay about that. Um, but I also 
obviously didn't read the staff report closely enough. It was wrapped into the golden handshake stuff that was happening at that time. Um, and there's a little asterisk that says this is going to be eliminated. So technically, I had been telling you that, oh, the position still exists. We just didn't, it just wasn't funded. But in fact, it doesn't exist. Um, so I have, as, as we planned, I've asked for that librarian position. I've also asked for an upgrade to the clerk one full-time position. And those are both still in this budget. Um, there are a lot of people asking for positions. Um, so it remains to be seen what happens, but I think people understand that um, our expectation was that we had 10 full-time positions and we, we would like to continue that. And, and the fact is, you know, we've gone from 11 to 10. Um, and if we go to nine, it will have impacts on services. You know, we, we can't be open seven days a week on nine full-time employees. So I think that um, we'll see where it goes. I, I think that they, you know, hope to be able to fund that position for us. Um, so the concession that I made, it, uh, again, part of, the, part of the issue with the staffing budget is that it has really skyrocketed on the part-time side, be, well, both sides, but the part-time because of the, the minimum wage going up by a dollar every year. Um, and then we've also had um, step increase, you know, we've had some cost of living increases that we hadn't had for many years. So the budget that, that um, you know, three years ago, the staffing that would have cost 265,000 is, is much more than that now. So I had estimated, you know, that in an ideal world for part-time budget to staff us seven, hour, seven days a week, 57 hours a week, was about $323,000. And you can see now that the number is down to 300,000. Um, and that was a, a concession to try to keep that full-time position in the, in the mix. Um, and, and we can do that. I mean, we will have to be mindful and, and keep an eye on it. I, again, we've talked as a staff and we haven't talked about it at length yet, but you know, we're thinking, um, we'd like to maybe close at eight o'clock instead of nine because that hour from eight to nine is, is nobody is here and it's, um, it's not a very productive time and that would save us a good chunk of money on the part-time budget, just taking out those four hours Monday through Thursday. Um, I also did calculations for if we went to a six day week, you know, where maybe we're closed Monday or, or whatever. I know that uh, people are interested in the library being open the weekend days because of the, so that people can use the library on the weekend. But, you know, maybe we, if we did a six day week, that obviously would save a lot of money on the part-time budget. So I think these things are all kind of in, in flux. Um, hopefully we'll have a, a good idea pretty soon about how it's balancing out. You know, finance was meeting with all of the departments this week um, and going over all their requests and their budget. Um, you know, I don't think our budget is, it's not excessive. You know, we're not asking for anything outrageous. So um, hopefully they'll be able to make it work for us. You know, Kathy, um... In my experience in, in dealing with you know, budgets and people and all this kind of stuff, is unless you can automate things to reduce staff, then you don't have much of a, a shot of reducing staff without impacting service. And, and the options you seem to keep giving are, I'm going to impact your service if you don't give me my staff. Is there any other options? Well, we've made some strides toward more self-service type activities since I've been here. You know, we we got the self-check machine. We have the app so that people can, you know, hopefully help themselves more. But this community is a very um, <clears throat> they they like to be served. <laughs> um, they're not interested in taking advantage of self-service and you know. But, but we have, I mean, we outsourced all of the processing of materials, which is how we were able to eliminate a, a clerk two in the support services department. Um, so we have taken some steps to, to doing things that will, uh, you know, allow our staff to focus on more, you know, put their efforts into better things. 
find free is a huge example. We spend a huge amount of time, had spent in the past, a huge amount of time dealing with fines, collecting them, doing the money, sending the letters, you know, a huge amount of time. So, so that's a time saver as well. So, so, so maybe when you're building the case, you might want to point out all the things that you've done to, to, to automate or streamline as much as possible. And so now the only option that you're left with is somehow to reduce service. And, mm -hmm. and certainly it may well be that, you know, no one's going to miss, you know, that hour, you know, from eight to nine. But I, I guarantee you people are going to not be happy if they find the library hours are permanently less than they were and, and Sundays don't open. You know, people are people already asking me, are they going to open on Sunday? No. Are they going to go back to the hours they had? Not right now. No. Right. You know, and and uh, it, it's a little difficult to justify. Beyond, beyond you know, a, a short period of time. Yeah. I mean, we expect we'll, we'll go back to the hours, but like I said, um, yeah, yeah, but, 2021, 22 but, budget. But, but, Kathy, you're telling me now you might not be able to go back to the hours if you're not given the staff that you're requesting, if you don't get that additional person. Well, we definitely have to look at that. I mean, if that if that's the case, it, it well something to something to mull over, Kathy. So something to mull over, Mister. I'm know, sorry. Say that again. Something for for you to discuss with the. New city management and, and so on, um, who don't have the background, who don't have you know you, your understanding of the community and the, the importance of this library in the community. So when is yeah. when is the twenty when is the twenty one twenty two budget finalized? Though I thought I thought we were the community was doing input for the budget. They sent out a survey and, and it ranked what you know, the residents yep. were interested in. So is there any more uh, input from residents in the community that we can give to the budget uh, talks? That's a good question. I'm not sure if they go back out to the, I mean, other than taking it to, Diana might be able to speak to this, other than, you know, going to city council to, to present it so that it's publicly presented. Um, I don't know if they do another round of actual input, okay. uh, you know, in a formal way, like they do initially. We're in, we're in May now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We're well, very behind because the 2020 21 budget wasn't approved until March. So everything. Yeah. Uh, so people are having a hard time. Excuse me. Just let me. People are having a hard time understanding how this mismanagement of budget, funds, and so on can possibly continue in our little city here. So, I can speak to that, David. Thank you. The problem is that a former finance director did not reconcile accounts for almost 10 years. We had a forensic audit. There wasn't any money actually missing from um, city accounts, but it wasn't in the correct locations. And it took an extraordinary amount of time to go back through old city council meeting minutes and figure out when council directed that funds be moved from one account into another account. And, and this wasn't discovered until um, 2018, I believe, is when it was discovered. <laughs> and and um, the reconciling went back, I think at that time, 2010, and um, then we had a finance reorganization and we didn't have enough people in finance. We have just, city council has just within the past month, I believe, um, authorized the conversion of a half-time um, employee to a full-time employee. But that's why that took so long, that delayed the 2019 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, and members of City Council did not want to approve the current fiscal year, 19, yes, 1920 um, budget until that CAFR was completed. 
And so it's, it's because of prior financial mismanagement, not in terms of money missing, but just the prior finance director mismanaged the department for years and years. And it wasn't discovered until um, very, very late in his tenure. Yeah, you know, Diane, um, I've heard that. I've heard, I've heard a lot of that. I mean, I tend to listen to the council meetings and so on. And somewhere along the way, we have to go forward with a budget that starts July 1, that is understood and, 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 and it feels like that the, this city is on an even keel right well, now. And that's, that's the intent, David. I was going to um, mention that uh, the Finance Commission, which is meeting May 27, will consider the finance, the uh, 2021 um, budget for the city, excuse me, 21, 22. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is 21. Yeah. <clears throat> and so um, that would be an opportunity for members of the public to weigh in as to the various um, uh, budgets for each department. And I believe that the it's intended that then city council will review the budget in draft form at our first meeting in June, and that it's intended that we would then approve the budget at our second meeting in June before the beginning of the next fiscal year, which begins July 1 of 2021. And, and that budget will presumably have ramifications associated with it, as will that meeting of the Finance Commission. So if the library is not able to maintain the hours of service that we are anticipating as a community, we will know that. Yeah, I mean, the, that, that budget should include our, you know, what they anticipate funding for our staffing. And based on that, we'll know whether, whether that position has been granted um, and whether we've gotten the part-time budget funds that we think we need. So yeah, that will be in that proposal. I mean, we'll know. We'll, well know. I, I, I will know, however, Kathy is correct in noting that a number of departments um, are requesting additional personnel. Council also, at the same time that we approve the conversion of a half-time employee in finance, we approve the conversion of a half-time employee for the planning department. Essentially, the city does not, as Kathy notes, our residents expect a very high quality of service and the city simply has not, um, <laughs> as time goes on, the demands of the legislature and the imposition that they put on local governments has increased and it is just becoming increasingly complex to run the city. And in addition to um, the minimum wage increases that Kathy noticed, another ramification was, um, and you know, obviously this has been in existence for some time, but um, the, uh, the development of affordable care and um, the effect upon um, employers in terms of their ability to keep part-time employees without having to incur liability for their healthcare expenses. Well, I, I, to Dave's point, you can't have your cake and eat it too. And if we find ourselves in a position where we have to make some cuts, I would rather have a well-run library that is open six days a week than a poorly run library that's open seven. So if we have to make those difficult decisions, I would like to, to err on, my, my advice is you err on the side of quality rather than quantity. And I do think it's incredibly important to be open on Sunday. Um, as a former working parent, we just have too many working parents who really need to access um, the library on both weekend days. And Kathy, if you're not getting that much business between eight and nine, that does sound like um, a good way to help to increase the service in, in a way that doesn't 
diminish the services. And I agree with the mayor. I think it is important to keep the library open on the weekends. I would weigh in that um, my experience in the various re revenue measures over the last five years, um, one of the major uh, points that we, we raised with the community and seemed to get a lot of positive feedback on, and we did that because of survey results that showed was that closing the library even one day a week is something that this community is extraordinarily opposed to. Yeah. And I, I appreciate your, um, your position, uh, uh, Dr. Lena, that, and I agree with, it would be better to run everything very well six days a week than poorly seven. But if um, instead of closing a day, we could shift a couple of hours on our least traffic days and our least traffic times, I think that would be highly uh, more advisable than closing a day. Because that's just, especially since we do need to renew the, uh, as a city and as the library needs to review, renew that, um, uh, that funding next year. Well, and all the more reason to renew that funding, but I'm not sure that cutting four hours of part-time staff a week is gonna be enough to keep us open full-time uh, one day a week. So, you know, there are trade-offs. And I think this is also a good reason or, or a good bit of information to use as we approach people and say, we need to continue funding the library. Well, that, that's my point is that I'm, I'm more speaking to our, our guests from the city government in terms of priorities and the uh, feedback that the community will have, the very negative feedback the community will have if we're forced to uh, shut down the library even one day. So that's uh, just my observation based on data. Yeah, and, and, and if you think back to what the usage of the library was pre-pandemic, I mean, you could go in the library and there'd be just simply loads of um, you know teenagers in there working on projects. It, it, it's high usage. In fact, Kathy, have you have you got the uh, statistics from the uh, thing that you turned in at the I think it was the end of the year to the state, so we can compare. Well, I mean, we um, no. yeah. I mean, I have our report, but those statistics are are kind of odd because the pandemic was happening. So you'd want to look at the prior year. But, uh, but an average um, you know, number of people was probably 20, 22,000 people a month. Yeah, and, and in healthcare, a lot of people are budgeting off of 2019 data. So yeah. that's probably what you're gonna have to do. Yeah, and, and again, I, I'm not saying that absolutely the answer to this is that you have to go to six days a week, but, it, but, it, but my staff have been giving more than is fair for years yes. um, without enough staff and without enough support from their administration. And um, they're at a breaking point. I have staff who, who they don't even earn vacation because they can't take it. Their vacation balances are so big that they, they don't earn any vacation anymore. It's not, it's not okay. And we need to find a way you know, it, it takes people to run a service organization and we can automate and there are things we can do to, to try to make our, our ourselves more efficient and, and, you know, use our time better. That's certainly one of the strategies that we need to employ and we have been. But the fact is, if you have 22,000 people coming in a building, you need bodies there to do it. Yeah. And when you have a, a product that's going in the door and and back out the door, back in the door, has to go back on the shelf. It takes human bodies to do that. Um, and to stretch that out over seven days a week is really a challenge. And so, especially since we eliminated that support services position um, in order to get a children's librarian, that's one of the people that would normally work a Sunday or work a Saturday. Um, so I'm not saying that I really, I mean, I'm not, I don't have any necessarily preconceived ideas about what reduced services might mean, but it, but we have to face the fact that if we go from, you know, 11 full-time staff down to nine, 
the expectation that we're going to continue to provide 57 hours a week exactly like we always have isn't isn't um, it, it doesn't add up. It's tough. So we'll, yeah. you know, again, let's see. We need to see what happens. We need to see what this budget comes back. We need to see if they they fund this position, um, and then we'll, we go from there. So yeah, that that finance commission meeting will be will be where we'll see that information. Well, I'll probably see the information before that. So. Um, I'll see what I can share with you when I have a sense. I mean, as soon as they say to me, you, you know, we intend to, to try to fund this, I can let you know that or vice versa. And it sounds like we can start making public comment at the, um, the finance committee and at yeah. the, the council meetings. They're Absolutely. opening that up to uh, public comments. So, Absolutely. you know, and I, you know, and I would urge anybody who feels comfortable to, to make a public comment. And I know I- That was that was the question I was just gonna ask. Um, as trustees, do we have any restriction on uh, making public comment in terms of um, influencing the budget for the library? I'm not aware of any limitation. Are, are we allowed to de designate ourselves as a, a trustee or are we just a, public, a, a private citizen? I don't think you can speak for the commission, but you can speak as a trustee. You can right. identify yourself right. as a trustee. I would, I would never, I would never gain to speak for the commission. But, okay. Right. So I think when you introduce yourself, I think you, because oftentimes when I introduce myself, I say I'm a board of trustees member, and this is what I'm wanting to make a public comment, comment on. But I don't speak for the whole board of trustees. But I think, you know, we, yeah. When is that meeting? Oh, it is two weeks from tonight, beginning at 630. The finance meeting. I know what Correct. you're saying, Diana. Finance commission, two yeah. weeks from tonight, 630 p.m. All right, thank you. All right, well, it sounds like we'll be going, talking more about this. <laughs> yeah. I think Sally has something. Yeah. I, I was just going to say that I really have empathized with the library employees over the last five years or more where they have really been stretched to the, to the max. And the only reason they've had, we've had the quality is because of the personal integrity and commitment of the library employees to serve the community. They just, they just won't let it break them. <laughs> and, you know, in other departments as well, the only reason the employees, the, the residents get that quality is because of the staff. There is not enough staff in planning. There is way not enough staff in public works. No department has. I mean, they, the person who left being a city clerk said, well, maybe they'll find a unicorn. <laughs> so. It's not just us, you know, everyone is, is, is. But you all are so impacted because you have 22,000 people. And I was reading, you know, the, the a Walnut um, Library in Pasadena, they had, so they had 55, we had 22,000 every month in our little space. Yeah. Uh, if it's not uh, too much trouble to ask, is there a succinct statement of what it is, Kathy, that you're looking for from finance if someone wanted to make a public comment that could be articulated? Uh, yes, we can definitely, I, I don't want to throw one out off the cuff, but I can definitely sure. think if, about if you that. If provide one without violating any Brown Act or anything, that would be... Yeah, I can uh, send an email. Again, I think once I get um, the next round of feedback from finance, I'll have better information about where, where this might be headed. And so, yeah, I can definitely follow up by email before the Finance Commission meeting. Um, to, to give you a sense of what what might what you might say, and I and I think David's point is well taken that you know just coming in and saying, well, if you don't give us you know this person, we're going to cut services. I mean, that's not what we're trying to say, and that's certainly not the message that I've been you know giving. It's it's just a a, a fact. It's a piece of it. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, the, the the comment we make might be that you know the library has taken a number of steps to to. Um, you know, automate and and try to be more efficient. Um, but the fact is that technology has actually made library work take more time. Um, yeah. And and so, 
it's, it's, you know, more time, but also it can be a thing that, that helps people do things for themselves. But yeah, there's definitely a statement that's, that's pretty. Yeah, that, that'd just be helpful in terms of staffing budget, yeah. you know, so it's like, Hey, if we, if we want the library to continue to provide the services that it was providing pre pandemic, when it reopens, it requires X number of staff with Y number of, of dollars. Yeah. Well, the other thing is um, looking to the future and having our library be 21st century, you need that back end person who's the tech person for not only this kiosk, but everything in the library. Like you said, it takes so much more back end. I think that's work. Kathy's point is automation is great, but you need somebody, uh, uh, the, um, that, that horrid remake of Willy Wonka with the, uh, the, the guy get, who, who screwed on the uh, toothpaste caps gets fired, but he gets rehired fixing the machine that screws on the toothpaste caps because that machine will break. Yeah. If you're going to have the machine, you got to have somebody who knows how to run it and fix it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm hopeful. I know that the city knows how much the library is valued and that, that the community thinks of it as a core piece of life here in this town. So I don't think that, um, I don't think anyone wants to see services reduced. I don't think anybody wants that. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. Uh, Kathy, I, I, do, I do have one question on the uh, proposed budget. Mm -hmm. it, it, and um, it's just a, a line item that I'm, either I've forgotten or I'm not familiar with. It's under the professional services, it's $5,000 for the development impact fee study. What is that? Um, so that's on the agenda for us to talk about. This is something that Sally uh, brought to my attention and it, maybe it's a, it's a good segue. Is it the next thing in the list? <laughs> it is, it is, no. it is the next item. Yeah, so perfect timing. Uh, we need money and one way <laughs> that we might be able to get money is if we were to have like some cities do a development impact fee for library services. Um, and Sally's the person who brought this to my attention and I didn't, I don't know why I never thought of it. I guess this town has not had, you know, for so many years, all the resources went into fighting the 710. And developers didn't develop here probably because you know no one knew what was going to happen. Um, so now development is sort of starting to take off again. And, and as these developments, uh, these residential pieces are, are getting built, all I can think, and the arena numbers, the housing requirement numbers, I'm, all I can think is, how are we gonna serve all these new people? And so Sally's point is um, we should look at just into having a development impact fee for library services. Um, and so I guess we, we sort of just wanted to talk about that with you. Sally, you might want to talk about it a little bit because you've yeah, got a lot um, of- We did, we look it into uh, who might have these fees and uh, Glendale, you know, just rebuilt their, their uh, main library and they get developer fees. Richmond, LA County, Berkeley, Oakland, Fremont, Los Angeles, Irvine, Sacramento, Roseville, Sierra Madre, and LA Unified School District outside of LA and inside the school district. And um, it just seems like Kathy said that um, with the very small facility we have and with all the planned developments, we have about 200 uh, or so more units that are approved right now to be built. I thought the feasibility uh, that looking into this was, was something to do uh, because if we're going to make any major improvements, um, we're going to need money, not just from the friends, but from other sources. Well, even if you're just going to maintain the services, 200 new units could be, I don't know, 800 new people in the city. Right. So it sounds like a very reasonable idea. Now those two 200 units are already approved. So that's past the time of collecting it. Uh, we have a growth requirement capital fee. And the purpose is to mitigate the unfavorable impacts uh, attributed to new development. There's three categories. Uh, the third is cultural and recreational facilities of which the library is a part. And it applies only to residential developments, not to commercial. Um, and in addition, 
Um, each new residential development has to pay a park facilities impact fee. And every year, uh, apparently the, the council sets the fee by resolution and the council has to identify the purpose uh, to which the growth capital fee is to be put. All this is paid, placed in a separate fund. There's residential and then there's commercial and if funds aren't spent, this is from the, uh, from the municipal code. If it's not spent after fee, uh, five years, the council must make findings describing why they continually need the money. And then there's public art. Uh, that's relatively new to 2018. Every new residential development of four or more units and any commercial, every commercial and industrial project uh, over 500,000 has to provide public art. Um, so I, I thought we could look into how much is in there now and how we can go about adding library or, um, or even requesting it because it's, it's, it seems to be in our code that we're part of recreational um, uh, and the other category we're already in there. It seems like maybe just an application, but I asked Kathy to look into how much that fee is. I don't really know. Uh, Mayor Mahmood, did you wanna say something? I was just going to um, mention that we do have a variety of, of uh, fees, water impact. Um, as Sally said, the recreational, frankly, I was unaware of um, the, I was unaware of recreational. I knew specifically of park impact, um, but I, I think it's definitely an idea worth exploring. Can we, I, can, we I, piggyback on any, can we piggyback on any of that, what Sally just said? Can so do we have to have a separate library impact fee or can we what's already in written? It sounds like we could already just well, piggyback, like you say, and request yeah. the funds. I don't even know if there are funds. So a couple of things that I'll say. I think that um, if there are funds somebody already thinks of them as theirs. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it, it's not, I, I think it would be tricky for the library to come in and say, hey, now we want a piece of that pie. Um, so I think, I mean, it's not that we can't look into it, obviously, but I think that probably a more likely solution is that we actually add a new development you mm -hmm. know, for developers to pay. Um, I did email, uh, the finance director and the interim city manager about this um, and, you know, telling them this, this is the idea that we have and we're going to talk about it as a board and um, they all think it's a great idea. Um, and, and the finance director, the interim finance director is the person who suggested that uh, typically, David, there's some sort of study that takes place. I do not know exactly what that looks like, but I put some money into the budget for that purpose. But again, I have no, I, I just have not this, had time to do this. This is a cost-based fee. So the purpose of the study is to establish the level of costs that, um, that are incurred so, so as to justify the fee. Because under Prop 26, you can't charge the fee without, it. it basically everything is cost-based. Yeah. yeah, I see. Okay. So, and I don't know, you know, I probably, we probably have under uh, budgeted for that. So it might be something that um, once we get a little more information about what that might cost to do that kind of a study, maybe that's a good use of Romine or Mullen funds to make up. Why the would the library have to pay for that? Well, I don't know the city, maybe the city could help. Mm. I don't know. I mean, again, we haven't gotten to the point where how we don't know yeah. how much it costs. Yeah. We, we need to we need to start this ball rolling. Um, and, and like Sally said, it's the, some of these big developments like Seven Patios and I don't know what right. the one is called, um, where the Mexican restaurant is, but um, you know, they're already in process. But if we could get this happening before the school district lot is developed. Um, Caro's. Caro's, it, it could be. It could be mm -hmm. um, really helpful to us. And I, I was trying, I've been trying to um, speak with Sheila Pouch, who's the director of community services, so I could kind of pick her brain about the parks 
impact fee mm. and the origin of that. I'm not sure if that's a, a local thing or a state thing. I'm not quite sure. Um, so I was going to see if I could get some information from her about that. Um, so I understand how that works, at least that piece in this city. And then again, there's a lot of other cities that have done this and have done the studies. So there's information there. We just um, haven't really started to move too much forward yet, other than raising the idea with the, the city management and um, Sally's done a lot of research. Can we do maybe a sub? Would it help Sally if we did like a sub committee? And maybe some of us could take on uh, some tasks to get this moving. Do you, is that, are we ready for that, Kathy? Or is, cause we have a new city manager now and. That's part of the, yeah. I mean, that's part of the challenge is that, you know, we're in this strange transition right. period right uh, now. Um, I don't think it is too early to set up an ad hoc committee because um, it's going to take you some time, and if you want to get ahead of these developments, um, oh yeah, the, the Caro's site, um, yeah. I think is likely. I think it's likely that um, we're going to see an application for that before the year's end. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I think time is ticking, and I would think that it would not be um, that it would not be that difficult to do the study, but I think you have to tie it to um, how much additional impact is anticipated due to the um, addition, basically applying marginal cost theory, I think, but this is not my area. Um, so Diane, that, that would just be one development then, right? Because the school district's not in the works yet, so. Right, It'd just be Caro's, which right. might be a bit as big an impact as these other five developments. Can we? But also, I I will say that you know I'm the planning commission liaison. We are getting dribs and drabs of individual developments, individual um, construction also occurring. Residential, you mean? Yes. Mm -hmm. Single family homes, you mean? Correct. Can we, can we do something to look at the library's costs on a per capita basis? So if we took the cost that we have now, divided that by the number of residents, maybe we get that from the census, we could get a per capita estimate of what our costs are and mm -hmm. then use that to project what future costs would be. Possibly, yeah. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. I, I think that's relatively easy to get. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, we know what the uh, population of South Pasadena is. Yeah. And, and I, again, going back to the impact of COVID, um, maybe you base it off of 2019, which I think a lot of people are doing, mm -hmm. and saying, here was our, our population estimate for 2019. Here's what our costs are. Every additional body brings in, you know, X number of dollars in additional mm -hmm. costs. Mm -hmm. right. and, is it a one-time fee or would it be like we would project this and say because these individuals will be here for 30 years or? So, well, so the developer, it's a one-time fee one -time. That, that they pay at the mm -hmm. time of, of their development being approved. And, and so it's a one-time fee. Well, I have a question sort of related to that. At what point does a developer have to start paying the parcel tax, the library parcel tax? Is it upon completion of their development or is it upon it's, striking the first uh, it's the shovel? property owner hmm? the property owner i understand the property owner but at what point in time do they start paying it do they do is it once they complete the development so if you've got a two to three year development before is that before <laughs> we see any money coming from them don't don't Pete, don't you have to pay property taxes yeah on yeah. whatever it is no matter if it's finished or not it might yeah. be less because it's an empty lot or something but yeah as soon as you own the property as soon as the title's in your name then they do it a pro rata for yeah. whatever that is onto your taxes and then at the value though so it'll obviously be worth more right so they, so they are at least paying something from, from acquisition of that piece of land they start to pay property tax. yeah yeah 
Definitely. And, 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 you know, the, the, the value and all of those residential units and the property taxes, you know, that, that will be significant for, for measure L funds, I would think. Um, I'm just thinking of like Keros. We're talking about Keros as an example. I mean, presumably whoever has acquired Keros right now is paying parcel tax. Yeah, that? absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm glad you brought parcel tax up because some someone might say, well, the library is getting the parcel tax and, you know, public works doesn't. But, you know, the other departments do get funds for street repair, park yeah. fees, Prop A, Prop C for transportation, CDBG money for sidewalk, um, police department gets funds from county or state. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, and I don't think. I was thinking about that too. Like, is there yeah. some, I tried to find out are there many cities where they have both a parcel tax and a developer oh. tax, but you know, it's two very different things. If I'm a resident, I pay my property tax, but I'd be thrilled to have a developer kick in, you know, they're yeah. developing in my city. Why it's not apples and oranges, you know? So right. I don't think, I don't think that um, residents would see this as, oh, well, if the developers are paying for it, then I don't have to we don't have to pay right. for it it's two different groups yeah I think it's very well, I, plus, I think it's different these these development fees that are paid are for infrastructure primarily so you're going to put more stress on the sewage the water the parks and that's why you have these things well the the library is a facility just like a park exactly right yeah we should be on we should get on this bandwagon i mean it's a great idea and is I, there any money yeah and i don't i don't, I don't think it's it. going to be a hard sell i i just i don't i mean didn't i mean they they, they got the art impact fee through. i know it i know that's they have to contribute art or pay for it yeah you know and i know lisa reynolds and the spark people were behind that and they mm -hmm. you know i mean mayor mahmoud i don't know if it puts you on the spot you might, uh, Bianca, you might say it's not going to be a hard sell, but if you're a developer, you just keep seeing these fees stacking up and they're becoming more and more difficult, and more and more expensive to, to work with our city. So, so we shouldn't underestimate it when they take a look and say, okay, I'm having to pay your parcel tax. Now you're asking me to pay a fee as well. You know, um, the housing, I'm sorry, the housing rates are, I, I think that the developers have a lot of incentive to be here and asking them to pay a minimal amount off of the amount that they're making. I will say like- I, I agree, but I agree a minimal amount. I think we should have a two-pronged attack. Yeah. There's already a fee in place on development that exists now. Yeah. And what we should do is go back to the city and say, we should be getting a portion of that. Then the second issue is, should there be an additional fee? But I, I do think we need to try to get some of that existing money. And yes, other people may have staked it out already, other departments, but you are a facility. The library is a facility that is impacted by development and therefore should be entitled to some portion of the current fees. Agreed. Well said, well said, Mark. <laughs> well said. Well said. I, I that should be our statement. So it, it's recorded, right? <laughs> That's okay. right? Yeah. So yeah. So do you want to have a subcommittee then to to work on this? Well, I think I I I think an ad hoc committee is okay. is a good idea. I don't know um, what can what two of the Brown Act. Two, only two of us can be yeah. on a committee, right? I, mean, so I think it would be to, helpful so that I can you know bounce i don't have to wait a whole month to yeah bounce things off of you and and tell you what we've done and discovered so i think it would be helpful if, if you guys could create an ad hoc committee do we have to can we just do that uh mayor mahmoud or do we have to have an action item on an agenda to make an ad hoc committee well, the topic is on the agenda so uh, i don't the topic is on the agenda, agenda. it's it's identified for discussion um, what you might want to consider in the future is not um, is not 
separately identifying what's for action and what's for discussion, because there's an inference that if you're going to discuss something that you're not going to take action. But I think in most instances, um, the fact that it, I think a reasonable inference is that you may take action if something is on discussion, but I would recommend um, that you not bifurcate action and discussion so that um, this question doesn't arise. Ooh, okay. okay. I, think that, I think it's a great suggestion, but I would also point out that I believe we sort of follow Robert's rules of orders. And anytime there is an issue that comes up, like a, a for a vote, there should be discussion. So discussion and votes go hand in hand. And uh, I agree with the mayor, we shouldn't bifurcate this into two different things. So, you know, I think we could I, perhaps form a, a subcommittee now if we wanted to. I think I, so, yeah. I agree. So someone just needs to move to do so, perhaps? Well, since I was the one who brought it up, I, I move that uh, we have a sub committee to further look into the development impact fee for library services. And then it would be two members um, from the board of trustees. Now, let me just for clarification, um, just to make sure, uh, Sally, um, because you brought this up, would it be, are you interested in kind of heading this and then she would be then the no, one she's not on our board she's not on the board no, so no. then we could have two board members and sally correct yes okay. i just wanted clarification yeah okay all right so okay. again i i move that we have an ad hoc committee of the board of trustees for looking more into the development impact fee for library services do i have a second you might wish to um include in your motion um identification of who would serve they are otherwise you need two separate motions and two separate roll calls it's, it's up to you it so would just be more efficient to combine it into one motion so we should discuss first who okay, so let me pull back my motion then so let's i'll rescind my motion for right now let's uh discuss so sally are you interested in sort of being on this ad hoc committee yes ma'am Okay, is there anybody else interested in being on this ad hoc committee? Dean? Okay, anybody else from the board? Kind of fits uh, my, uh, my habit. Yeah, and I'm, I'm interested too. So. Okay, great. Good, Good, back together. Good team. Okay. So and I'm happy to too if I can. I don't know if that's too many people. The only people that are limited are our board of trustees. Two trustees and then oh, okay. else that wants to be there can be there. So um, the, the motion is just to create an ad hoc committee of the board of trustees that consists of Bianca and Dean. Okay. Okay. So there's okay. So there's that there's the motion again. So an ad hoc committee for the development to look into the development impact fee for library services consisting of uh, Dean Sirwin, Bianca Richards, and then of the board, and then uh, Sally Kilby will be on yeah. it too to help us. And, and PJ. And PJ. Thank okay. you. And, and, and Bianca, you can basically bring any others that you choose to onto that uh, uh, ad hoc committee. As long as we're not the board of trustees, though. Right. Correct. Right, and I would have, you know, maybe uh, someone from the library would like to be in there. I, I, you know, I don't know. Maybe there's someone from uh, some other commission or something like that. Well, again, the, the ad hoc committee from the board of trustees will consist of Dean and myself. And then if we wanted to yeah. add to it or ask people who have maybe some uh, uh, specific expertise, we can go after those people. So do I have a second then? I'll, I'll second the motion. All right, thank you. So it's been moved and seconded. Do we need a roll call vote on this? Yep. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. Hey, Bianca Richards. Yes. Dean Sirwin. Yes. Dr. Molina. Yes. Annie Chang Long. Yes. David Ewens. Yes. Thank you, Sally, for bringing this up. That was that was very good. So yeah. So we'll get <laughs> One of my board members who worked on the L LA uh, Unified 
um, the library. And she said, well, that's how we've been building our libraries are these developer fees, you know, LA County libraries. County, wow. yeah. County has a developer fee. I asked her. And she yes. Great, okay. Okay. Uh, uh, board activity forecast, item number, discussion item number seven. Um, this is something you guys asked for. So we just created a very um, straightforward list of the, the regular actions that happen throughout the year. Um, we can add, you know, specific things that we know are going to happen or that we want to, you know, once we start um, thinking about the Measure L renewal and the strategic plan, if we want to start kind of slotting those things in, we can. But as a starting point, we just did the standard things that happen so that everyone kind of has an overview of what the year looks like. Thank you. I, it, it really helps me and I, uh, I'm the one who brought this up because the, the friends, you guys have a wonderful calendar and I thought, oh, I think the board, uh, we, we ought to have one too. So thank you, um, Kathy and Sean for putting this together. And that was in your packet, everybody, item number seven. Okay. Um, can, and then can again, I ask a question about that real quickly. Um, it, it doesn't mention certain months, and I'm wondering, are we dark those months? And I just was unaware of that. Or uh, February, meaning, June. meaning there's no action in the month. There's no standing items. Yeah. Yeah, that just means there's no standing item. It doesn't mean we're not meeting. Okay, I was just curious. Yeah. When just see a blank, I things guess. hit certain times of year and there are some months we don't have anything like that. And then um, again, um, items number, um, uh, well, really eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12 are all under this library work plan. So Kathy, you wanna? Yeah, I mean, I don't have, I don't have many, well, I don't have any updates on any of this except to tell you that we've been too busy to review any policies and prepare them to bring to you. So I apologize. Um, emergency plan, you know, Sean continues to serve on the citywide committee and that's helpful to kind of be connected with that effort so we know what's happening and we can make sure we're um, synchronizing with that. Um, obviously the procedures piece having to do with pandemics is, something we have been working on also. Um, but the other things, uh, strategic planning is another thing that we budgeted for in the next, in the next year's budget. Um, I don't remember what I did, 12,000, I think, and, or 10. Anyway, it was based on what we paid the last time. So um, uh, that's how I came up with that number. So that's really all I have. I don't know if anyone has anything about Sally, the 21st Century Committee for the Library. Do you want to talk about that now or do you want to talk about it when you get to your friend's report? I'll do it in my friend's report. Okay. Yeah. And, and Unless there's other things, David, you want to talk about? I could no, do I it right now. No, I don't have anything there. Okay, I'll just wait then, yeah. Then we're probably uh, done with that. Yeah. It, Kathy, did you have any though items under the library operations update or have you included everything then? No, I think I do have a few. Um, I wanna let you know that we have to, uh, one of our aides just resigned, um, really good aide. We're gonna miss her a lot, but she's moving to the desert. So we were gonna miss her. So we have two vacancies. We had already posted the position because we had one vacancy. So Daryl uh, is looking at those applications now. He has 79 qualified applicants to look through. Mm -hmm. So um, it's gonna take him a little time, but he's working on that. So hopefully we'll get those positions filled shortly. Um, we have a lot of programs coming up in May and June. Hopefully you mm -hmm. saw the press releases. I won't go into those at length since you would have seen them. Summer reading program press releases also went out today. Uh, they're way ahead of, well, I don't know, way ahead of schedule, but they're very organized and, and have everything ship shape and ready to go, which is fantastic. Um, you know, they're prepared to pivot to in-person things if, if we're able to. And, and, you know, so they're really trying to be flexible and, and make sure that, um, you know, they can react to whatever the current public health situation is. Um, as far as uh, equity, inclusion, and diversity, the city is, is still working on its um, 
plan for uh, training in that area. A number of our staff, the, the, the consulting group that they hired to, to manage that process for the city has been holding focus groups. Um, and a number of library staff participated in those focus groups. And my understanding is the purpose of the focus group is to, you know, get the input that they need so that they can create the right type of training for this city. So I'm glad that the staff were willing to, to participate in that. I, I did, and it was really interesting to be in a, in a focus group with people from other departments and, and hear what people have to say. Um, I wanted to let you know that the letters that you recommended get sent last time um, to our representatives for Build America's Libraries, uh, those went out. So, and now um, Representative Chu and our both of our senators are signers on that bill. So that was great. Thank you for doing that. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to mention is, or the second to the last, I guess, is uh, the state of California uh, budget possibilities. So the California Senate Democrats have their um, their budget priorities document. It's called Build Back Boldly. And um, they're looking at a library package of $1 billion uh, for library infrastructure, technology investments to eliminate library debt, which I think they mean customer debt. I think they mean to, to like we did to provide access to, to library users um, and provide ongoing sustainable funding for public libraries. So the legislature then asked the California State Library to survey California public libraries on their infrastructure needs. So I responded to that survey for South Pasadena and the State Library created a tool uh, like a dashboard where you can go and look by your um, district to see what the infrastructure needs are for your district. So it's really uh, interesting and I can send you that link. Um, it's a little bit embarrassing. We're one of the oldest libraries around, <laughs> which is no surprise, um, but it's kind of seeing it there in black and white is sort of shocking. You know, 39 years is, is old in library building terms. Um, so, it, but, it's, but it's interesting and, and I, not all libraries have completed the survey yet. At the last time it was like 55% and they were already up to like $3 billion in infrastructure needs. So who knows what will happen, but I mean a billion dollars for libraries would be huge. So we'll see where that goes and how that develops and I'll keep you posted about that. Um, and then the last thing I just wanted to mention is, as we mentioned it last time, that free Serving with the Purpose conference. That's a, it's not a conference, it's an hour and a half long event. Um, virtual event is happening uh, June 9th. The registration has to be done by June 1st. And uh, if anybody's interested, I can forward that link back to out again, but you already have it. But I just wanted to mention it because I got an email about it today. And the topic for that is, is fundraising. So Sally, you're probably- I'm going, i <laughs> signed up. Great. And that's all that I have, because I know it's late and we've had a lot to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you. So moving on uh, to uh, communications, um, I, I have nothing, nothing to add. Um, I think everything was covered in a lot of these discussions. Um, and I'll just go through with my board looking at my, my window here. David, do you have any communications? No, just uh, people in the community seem to be getting excited about the, uh, the opening of the reopening of the library. I, I have forwarded, you know, the uh, bounce press release that the commission has get to a number of people who've been asking about it. So, thank you for thank you for spreading the word. That's helpful. Annie, anything from you, Annie? Uh, just wanted to add on. I think that being able to maintain the level of services will be really great for a lot of the families that use the library. I know many people use it, but for the students who have been really socially isolated over the last year and really feeling it more than ever and super excited for reopenings and new play dates and things. So thank you, Kathy, for taking the charge on the budget section of that. And thank you for the great idea, Sally, today, um, raising that on the developer fees. Thank you, Annie. Dean, any communications? Thank you. I'd just like to echo what's been said and uh, acknowledge that uh, in order to maintain our library, both uh, inside and out, 
uh, and that includes the staffing so that we can have people come back in, uh, we get to uh, do what we can to uh, uh, encourage the finance and the rest of city government to properly fund uh, the library at the needed level. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mario. I have nothing to add. Okay. Um, let's see. Our uh, uh, Diana, our council liaison. I want to compliment Kathy on um, the cultural programming that is scheduled for next month um, in observance of um, Pride. I, I don't think the live, I don't recall the library have ever having similar programming. It's something I don't think uh, the library would have done five years ago. And I'm very, very proud to see it. Along those lines, um, I am wondering, I know at one point there was some discussion within the city of um, maybe contracting with Spark to engage Spark in cultural programming for the city, Kathy. And I was wondering if you could talk about that and um, indicate whether or not that is included in the library's budget or where else it, it might be. I can speak to that. So the, the original um, discussion and intent that the former city manager, Stephanie DeWolf and I had come to was that the assistant director position would, would be uh, eliminated and well, converted to a lower level position. And then the, the remaining funds would be used um, to hire somebody to do arts and cultural programming. And, and her idea was not that it would be under the library, it was to be under, um, uh, planning and long range economic development. So Margaret Lynn, basically, I think. Um, so spark, you know, I met with some spark members here because, you know, they, they would do programming in the community room, but also, also right. other places. Right. So they, we, we had a preliminary meeting where they looked at the, you know, the facility and the equipment to see, um, what's possible, what, what changes might need to happen to make it, uh, you know, adequate facility to do the kinds of things they might want to do. Um, but then COVID happened and, you know, nothing. So I don't know where that stands at all. I mean, especially given that they eliminated the position completely. And, and so there was sort of that money didn't go where we thought it would go at the beginning of the last fiscal year. So I'm not sure where that stands. I can tell you that Spark would be uh, very interested in pursuing uh, something along those lines. Diana, you might, that might be something you want to ask about. I mean, I can too, but it, it, it wasn't going to be a library um, person. It was going to be somebody who could, you know, really connect it with local businesses and, and, you know, economic development and restaurants and all of that kind of stuff. Okay, thank you. That is helpful. I, I do think we had um, robust cultural programming under our former library director and it always, um, it always disappointed me that there was absolutely zero commercial tie in. I thought the city is missing the boat by not seeking to, um, to partner with the chamber and with some of our businesses to maximize the benefit um, to the city from sponsoring such events. So I will do that. Thank you. Uh, that's all I've got. I'm, I'm excited about the exploration of the library impact. Is, as um, I mentioned, I think it can only cover the marginal cost of serving the additional um, residents that would be located resulting from the library, but um, it's it's something. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, friends, Sally. Yes, uh, the Library Appreciation Month was April and that was well received. And PJ was one of them heading it up. Do you wanna just talk for a second how, how it went over and what, what we did? Um, I can take very little credit for this. I don't know if any of you know Linda Dioro, but she was the one who really took this on and each week did a display with treats and prizes and 
we just really wanted to show the library staff how much we appreciate them and remind them how extraordinary they are. And I think the message was received. It sounds like it was, but we were happy to do it because you all do so much for all of us every day. Yes, and we got a very lovely thank you card from the library. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> Uh, 21st Century Exploratory Committee. We had our first meeting in April. We have our second meeting uh, next week. Kathy Billings is going to join us um, as liaison, which will be great because issues, questions have come up. And I sent her a summary of what we did discuss last time. Uh, we have a fundraising professional on our committee and uh, we gleaned a number of things from the first uh, meeting. Um, to seek major gifts, uh, we learned we, and to maintain uh, long-term fundraising, infrastructure must be in place, transparency, stewardship, documentation, accountability, tracking, cultivation, continu continuity, all of these things have to be in place to do long-term fundraising. Um, we brought up the Crowell where there was just one fundraiser and uh, if there's just one, uh, one capital campaign and that's all you're doing, uh, that can be done with a fundraiser and a book, bookkeeper. What's also necessary for us is to have a CAFR uh, for any funders. Um, we learned that we could do a feasibility study prior to any capital campaign to determine the community's um, giving capacity. Is it really there? And I know P PJ works for SPEF and raising money is hard to do, large gifts. Uh, we, we talked about starting with uh, a technology campaign, which we do every year. Um, and we can have a small fundraiser and not ask for money and just raise the awareness of the need in the library. If people just took a tour of the library to see, like you say, Kathy, how old it is and how many systems are failing from ventilation to everything, um, just to get to know the library and to know the res to get to know the residents who feel strongly about the library. So uh, looking forward to our next uh, meeting. And one of the things we've started to do is um, create a letter to uh, estate attorneys. There are 30 estate attorneys that I have um, gathered their information about and we've prepared a letter to uh, let them know we're looking for bequests and Kathy's looking at that right now and then we'll, we'll send it out and follow up um, and see if there's any interest. Those are Pasadena and South Pass um, attorneys. And uh, as you know, the library is opening, the bookstore will be opening in um, June, but the last chance books, which are on the first floor will be for sale on uh, the 17th when you open. Thank, and thanks to you, Kathy, for Ooh. arranging that. Uh, we're having a huge kickoff uh, book donation drive on the 22nd from one to three in the community room. Thank you again, Kathy, for letting us use the community room for collecting and sorting. Uh, and thereafter donations can be brought to the library. And we've really done a huge publicity blowout to um, the South Pasadena, to Next Door, 91030, PTA newsletters, uh, Friends website, this, this, um, the library website, and it will be in the Scoop, uh, City Scoop next week. Thank you, Kate, Kathy, for your help and your employees' help. Here's our little flyer that's being sent around. And we had an article on uh, in the South Pasadena online today and with a photo of the community room taken by our hospitality committee members, Cindy Bemmel. So that's kind of what we've been up to. Does anyone have any other, have questions? Um, Sally, I do. Yes. What is, this, what is the status of the um, concert series and oh. its relationship to the Friends? Thank you so much. I forgot that part. The Restoration Concert Series. Um, we received word that um, the two co-chairs 
Kay Rosser and Kay, Kathy Folsom are relocating to Colorado. And that's, this is more than a 25 year uh, dynamic duo that has been putting on these concerts. Uh, and we, leave, we received a letter from Janet Irvin, a uh, committee member and liaison. Their season is set, um, the 21-22 season for, to start September. The costs are covered by uh, what they've made in the preceding year. Um, we have a meeting set up tomorrow with our key people to talk about the changes that will be necessary. They will not have a bookkeeper anymore that they've had all along. We've been changing our procedures where every, every group that is under the friends has to um, uh, adhere to procedures that are the same as far as financial. So um, they will not have a bookkeeper. Uh, we will need to see oversee the con contracts um, for the musicians, uh, and they do plan to simplify all their operations. So we'll be discussing that uh, tomorrow at, in a subgroup of the friends, and then meet with Janet Irvin and the um, the committee, the Restoration Concert Committee, and I believe that the two co-chairs are going to be involved in some way, but doesn't look like in the the leadership um, the way they were before. Thank so you for both, both Kathy, both Kathy and Kay are moving to Colorado. Yeah, I, I drove by Kathy's house today, and it's an escrow. Yeah, yeah. and now and Kay just sent us a letter. Uh, I think two days ago was it PJ saying that her husband asked her if she would um, relocate to Colorado for at least eight months out of the year. So I'm not sure what that means, but um, it sounds like pretty much she'll be there most of the time. <clears throat> it's a big change. Big and change, <clears throat> huge. I, I told Andy Lippman they need to be recognized all that they've done yeah, for the self-testing review. So I know he's gonna start working on that. <clears throat> yeah. Any Anything else, Sally, from the friends? No, I, I didn't. Thank you, Diana. I completely forgot that section. <laughs> okay. And then, uh, David, anything to add for uh, liaison to the friends? You, you went to the last meeting. Oh, did I? Okay. Yeah, you, you had to come up on me. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, it's been. But, it's so been I have too long, to Diana. Diana. <laughs> to I mean, your question, you know, I have nothing to add. Okay. <laughs> I, then I, I have nothing to add either. <laughs> no, no, good. Yeah, we covered it. I think. Yeah, yeah I, think I think we're well covered. Yeah. Um, okay, and then back to you, back to you, Kathy. Any other uh, communications? Um, I just want to say thank you to all of you for supporting library and library staff and being so passionate about the library and the services we provide. I think the staff are also passionate, so we appreciate that you are passionate. Um, and I just appreciate your knowledge and wisdom and, and that you're willing to, to share it and, and help us figure out what's, what's next and what's best. Um, it's been a, a tough, crazy year, but we're getting through it and we're excited to be coming out on the other end. And so looking forward to good things and just appreciating you guys and, and all of your support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gabby. Thank and that's it. Okay. Hey, any other last comments or thoughts? All right, then I'm adjourning the meeting at 8.51. Thank you, everybody. This was Bye. a very good meeting. Thanks for the discussion. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Good night, everybody.